also acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we gather. And I acknowledge the grace and the tolerance in which they allow us to be here. I also want to acknowledge though, the 52 women, Australian women, that have been murdered since the 1st of January this year. 52 women. If that's not a national outrage, I don't know what is. We have governments that want us to live in fear of terrorism. Some women live, in, live with it every day of their lives. The terror is locked in their homes. 52 women. We barely acknowledge them, let alone remember who they are. But they are someone's daughter, someone's mother, someone's sister, someone's friend, someone's work colleague. I guess what I want to say in talking about wicked pickets and, and sexism, it is a continuum. We can't isolate one from the other. The, the deaths and the homicides of women are one end of a continuum of sexist behaviour and language that allows this to flourish. We still live in a society where women aren't equal, where sexist behaviour on the whole isn't um, challenged, where we think the put down of women, most people I guess, you know, may see the wicked um, campers and think, oh, that's a bit off. But by the same token, they will engage in other types of sexist language. I was at a, um, my, one of my young grandsons plays AFL and he came off the field quite upset. He said, oh, Nan, someone told me I was playing like a girl. I said, well, you must have been brilliant. And his face lit up and he said, is that true? And I said, yes, it is. And it's the language that we allow to flourish play like a girl, walk like a girl, run like a girl, talk like a girl, cry like a girl. What's that actually say about girls? And what's it say about boys that they would be so demoralised to think that they could be likened to a girl? I think we all need to challenge ourselves around the language that we use. With Wicked Campers, I guess their slogans are part of that language that allows us to degrade women, to objectify women and to promote violence against women. We have ongoing campaigns. As um, Anna said, I've been doing this for a long time and quite frankly, I think I'm getting a bit too old and tired to be keep coming out on the streets. But I initially did it for my own family, for my um, sons, for my nieces. And now I'm doing it for my granddaughters. I don't want them growing up in a world where this is okay. We know that one in three women in Australia will experience violence across their lifetime. But I would say three in three women, because of that, will experience fear across their lifetime. You don't have to be abused by a male to have that fear of males. Women may be frightened in their own home, but they're also frightened on our trains at night, on unlit bus stops, of not being able to walk the streets, I've been home and having to lock their doors. And it's got nothing to do with what women wear, how much they drink, what they have to say. We know that women get abused in a whole range of things. I was recently doing some research recently around a paper and was appalled at the amount of older women that have been sexually abused in nursing homes. As high as one in five women in nursing homes experience some form of violence, but but shockingly sexual violence. It goes across women's whole life continuum. So we do it for our girls, but we have to remember that wherever women are and whatever space they're in, they're gonna be vulnerable to violence. Yesterday we heard our Prime Minister had put out a challenge to men. You need, men need to tell other men to pull their head in. I think it's the wrong message. We need to tell other men to stick your neck out, to stand up, take a stand. Men need to be accountable for their violence, but they need to be accountable for their silence. We need good men, men that are here at this rally to be saying, violence against women is not okay. We can make a stand, we can march with women, we can work to end this scourge, because men need to do it for the women in their communities as well. One of the things we've been trying to do through the Queensland State Government is establish a domestic violence 
death review. Because tragically, we know that when women are killed by their partners, that those deaths are in large are preventable. They have protection orders that are a breach with impunity. They have courts that don't take their stories seriously. They have their pleas and their cries for help discounted. It's not like that people say, why don't they leave? Many do leave. They're stalked, they're harassed, they're tracked, they're followed, sometimes for years. Women are fighting for their safety, but they're also fighting to stay alive. They're fighting for their children and they're fighting against systems that should be there to protect them. So while we, um, I guess, have campaigns about businesses like Wicked Campers, don't forget we all know it, so need to be, I guess, challenging the systems of our society. We hear lots of rhetoric. We've got to stop domestic violence. We've got to stop sexual assault. We've got to stop bullying and sexual harassment. But until, I guess, we get quite serious through our politicians, when we can have our first female Prime Minister described as some man's bitch, we've got a long way to go. But the degradation of women isn't a joke. Women aren't out there for entertainment. Women are out, aren't out there for entertainment. So the catcalling, the touching, there's a project, um, and I urge us all to get on the website and have a look at it. It's called Everyday Sexism. The last time I looked, there was over 200 pages of where women wrote in about the sexism that they had experienced. It is real. And one of the things I wrote for a male was, He'd never thought about it. He worked for the railway and he'd never thought at night that women will walk the train to find a carriage where they're going to feel safe. That they're scanning that environment to see, am I safe sitting here? Some of those things as women, we do. We take it for granted that's what we're going to do. So when violence affects one woman, I say it affects all of us. And that's what links us as women. Anna talked about it is, it's a women's issue, but it's also a male's issue. You know, women um, need to get out there and support other women, and we stand up and we speak out and get about it, but we need males and males in um, positions of power that can do that. We need to hold our politicians accountable. It's no good saying we're going to stop domestic violence, but on the other hand, they're cutting services. They're cutting funding to shelters. They're cutting um, programs. They're cutting money to legal services that help women get protection orders and can go to the courts and seek some safety. So we need to, um, I guess more than encourage, we need to demand of our politicians that they actually walk the talk. The amount of money that is put out there for terrorism is, a, is in stark contrast to the reality that women are dying. 52 women, shocking, shocking. If people aren't appalled by that, then you're not listening. And I think that we need to keep reminding people just how widespread and, and um, perversive, I guess, violence against women in all its forms. Violence against women in the public, through sexual harassment and stalking, um, through pornography, through um, signs like Wicked Campers, but also in the home. For kids growing up where there's violence in the homes, we need better programs. But we need people that can get into government and walk the talk. It's gone way past Royal Commissions. I don't know how many inquiries we need to have. It's there. Over the years, you know, one of the benefits, I guess, of being an old girl, I've seen it all before. There's report after report after report goes into government. And when uh, Quinton Bryce went out to Mena Isa to talk to the Aboriginal women out there, they just said, can you go back to the X number of reports that have been done? Because that's all they are. So we need to actually make sure we're holding governments to account for what they're doing. Domestic violence is often seen by those in authority 
police, courts, as just a domestic. It's not just a domestic. What you do could save someone's life. What you do could change it for the better. But we see protection orders breached time and time and time again. And we say, not good enough. Not good enough. The first opportunity for intervention should be the most important. We need to take every single incident of violence seriously and not wait till police are ringing for a hearse. 52 lives. I'll just leave that sit there. Thank you.